Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shane McCollum, and I'm a project manager at Science Business. I'd like for you to watch this video. Cities are getting bigger and bigger. By 2050, 82% of Europe's population will be urban. And as cities grow, we keep adding technology. We're sensing, filming, measuring, analyzing and controlling our urban environments constantly. Add the routine problems of bad traffic, noise pollution, fouled air and lurking crime, and the modern smart city starts to look pretty dumb, if not downright unlivable. Can we fix that? Can our best minds in urban planning, civil engineering, computer technology, sociology and other fields find solutions? Blue sky thinkers from across the world are trying to do exactly that. How citizens deal with this data management interests Jennifer Gabris. My research looks at environmental sensing technologies and public participation. So we're asking what role citizen gathered data can play and how that might improve forms of urban governance. We're doing this research across three project areas, including pollution sensing, urban sensing, where we particularly look at the role of the citizen in smart city projects, and as well as wild sensing, where we look at how citizens might monitor the activity of wildlife in order to be more engaged with questions like biodiversity and so on. Modeling the cities of the future is also an immense task. Luke van Gool is working on that problem. There are quite a few 3D city models available, but we want to extend them in two ways. First of all, we want to add a level of understanding so that buildings consist of floors, windows, uh, doors and so on. If you have this understanding, you can look into different areas like how much light would come into an apartment because you know where the windows are. And secondly, we want to have also traffic flows added to cities so that uh, city models become much more realistic, they are dynamic. You would know what are the levels of pollution, for instance, or how busy a certain street should I send my children down that street to go to school. These scientists are among thousands being funded now by the European Research Council, the Frontier Research Science Agency for Europe. In a moment, I'll invite on stage two of the researchers you just saw in the video, plus a third researcher who also contributed, uh, Bastian Leiber. But before I do that, I'd like to give you a little background on the project. In October of 2015, Science Business, along with seven of its partners, embarked on a 42-month multimedia campaign designed to reach a wide target of specialists and non-specialists, uh, using traditional web and social media, but also innovative narrative props, such as interactive in-depth articles written by journalists, uh, augmented reality, videos, cartoons, and pop-up displays to be used at science centers, museums, and other public spaces around Europe. Here you can see a listing of our partners. We're working with University College Cork, CNC Aviva, the medical faculty at the University of Zagreb, the University Imuni, Excite, Vision 2020, and IRMA. To convey the message, the campaign will employ popular themes, such as one you just saw uh, on urban spaces, healthy aging, and music, to communicate the Blue Skies research that's being done by ERC-funded grantees at a level and a format appropriate to each of the targeted audiences. Today, we're launching that communications campaign with the theme, The Human City. The first theme spotlights numerous funded ERC researchers who are studying everything from how algorithms are upending city management to how our infrastructure is failing to protect us from, uh, apologize, from how our infrastructure is failing to protect us from earthquakes and tsunamis, uh, to how traffic noise moves beyond being a simple annoyance into something that's bad for our health. What I would like to do now is, or rather shortly, is invite those three researchers to give you just a view of what it is they're doing and how they're contributing to the smart city of the future. Uh, before I do that, I would just like to invite you all following this program to visit our website at www.sciencesquared.eu and also to read our featured interactive article titled Wanted, the Human City. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Van Gool on stage to discuss with us some of the research he's doing in this area. Professor Van Gool. So 
Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Shane, for the uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm working on an advanced TRC project called Varsity Variation in the City. Um, and actually, the goal of that project would be to build new generation models of cities. So not only 3D cities as we are used to them, where actually you have more like simple boxes with the texture uh, mapped on, and then it's left to the brain of the observer to make sense of that. So the first uh, difference that we want to make is to have a clear understanding of the underlying 3D structure with uh, concepts like uh, floors and doors and windows and so on. And uh, secondly, we also want this model dynamic. So we want to populate it with a traffic flow. And within that traffic flow to recognize different agents like cars, pedestrians and so on. And there are uh, clearly new applications that such models would support. I gave the uh, examples in the video before, like if you know where the windows are, you would know how bright an apartment would be, and that's important in estimating the value, value of uh, real estate. Or if you know the traffic flows that will happen on a certain time, on a certain day, then you can predict what would be a safe route uh, to school for your children. Now, from a technical point of view, um, the core of the project that we is that we want to take a holistic uh, view on computer vision, so making sense of images with computers, by combining 3D recognition and tracking. Okay, the starting point in 3D, so the first of these three components, is that so far 3D is rather dumb in a sense that okay, we built uh, a precise geometric replica but there is no meaning attached to that replica. And here we see an example. You would start from a, p a point cloud, a soup of uh, points in 3D, uh, and you could then texture that. We can go on to the uh, next step of the video, please. So here we see, in fact, a triangulated uh, mesh. If we go on, then we will see that we get also texture on, and it becomes very recognizable for humans. But still, to the computer, this is simply a bunch of 3D points. If we can go on in the movie, it would be good. So, you see, this is in fact now a very recognizable 3D structure, but of course, it's because your brain makes sense of it. It's not in the computer itself, that understanding. Okay, so that's the difference we want to make here. We, for that, we use so-called procedural modeling in 3D, and that means you have this list of uh, rules to describe a building. So on top, on the right, you have the Maison Carré as an example in uh, Nîmes, in France. Below is, in fact, the result of the rules that you have on the left. And now you have this very compact model with understanding what the different parts are, and it generates you very compactly a, high precise, a highly precise uh, description. Second component was tracking. Track is important in the project because we want to understand the traffic flows, as I said. So here you see at the one crossroads in Zurich, you have the different times, the different cycles when cars and trams can move according to certain um, directions. And we automatically analyze those as well to indeed understand the typical traffic flows. Recognition. Uh, so on the left you have an image. On the right hand side you have the understanding of the computer after this automatic processing goes on, where you would have in red windows, you have balconies, you have the blue roof there, you have the yellow wall. And if we have that, we can actually improve the 3D models. So again on the left, what I just discussed, and on the right hand side, you would have this now structured model. So this is a computer model generated from the image on the left. Okay. But now with concepts like windows and doors and, and all that, which is new in this area. Okay. So if you look at this uh, video, you see the difference between the typical classical way of having just a box for that uh, building and smashing a texture on versus the structure description on the right, where we know where the windows are, that it would lie a bit deeper, even th if that is difficult to measure exactly in 3D. Um, we would also have some reflections in those windows, making it a much more vivid and realistic uh, visualization. At the same time, more compact as well, and supporting more applications. 
here we have another combination of different components. I don't want to get technical, but here we try to analyze how different people are moving in that environment. Uh, with respect to that environment, we understand the 3D structure now. We have the understanding that these are people, because we recognize them as being people, and we can track them. So you see all those components nicely working together. And in fact, this is what uh, will now all be combined in the next generation visualizations, uh, the next Google view, if you want, of uh, our cities. To finish, I can say that we have created quite a few companies in the group already. Innovation has been mentioned, also how to uh, get an impact on the economy. I think we had an impact already. So these are a subset of uh, the companies we created, about 12 by now. Uh, and in fact, for this project, for this ERC project, there are two classes here. The green ones are the ones that pre-existed the uh, proposal, the project, and have actually helped with generating it by having on a larger scale data being uh, measured, which is often difficult for uh, universities to do. And then the ones in red have been created during and as a result of the ERC uh, grant, which I must say is fantastic to have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. In a moment, we'll have some questions for Luke so he can go a bit more into his research. Uh, and I'd like to call Jennifer Gabriz to the stage. There you go. Cheers. Thanks, uh, Shane and Science Business for the uh, invitation. Um, as you will have seen in the video, I'm leading the Citizen Sense project, which is based at Goldsmiths, University of London. And what we're looking at is the use of low-cost sensor technologies by citizens to better understand their environments. So we've done this work already in the area of pollution sensing, and now we're looking at urban sensing in smart cities. So smart cities are often featured like this, um, a kind of overarching diagram of the ways in which sensors, uh, the Internet of Things, will help to improve urban functions. And here you see a, a map from Labellium, which is a Spanish tech company. So everything from smart energy to smart uh, grids for traffic construction and congestion to noise maps and more. One area of particular interest for us is air pollution sensing, which is what we've looked at um, in more detail. And this is what you find in these uh, visions, is that citizens are an important part of how smart cities are meant to function. But what do those practices actually look like? So that's what we're looking at in much more detail. And has been mentioned, and this is quite working, has been mentioned earlier um, in the innovation panel, is that open innovation and co-creation are really an important part of looking at how technologies are used. So that's what we're looking at here um, in this particular project, is how to make technologies, how to put them out into spaces where citizens are using them, and to see what happens, not as an end-user problem, but as a kind of process along the way. So as part of that, we've done some sensor testing, and we've looked at a lot of off-the-shelf technology, not just technology that we can build ourselves. So here you'll see a very popular air pollution sensing technology called the Air Quality Egg. And this technology, um, which is meant to be just a plug-and-play technology, we found is actually quite difficult to work with as a kind of if you didn't necessarily have advanced technological knowledge. And the data also that the, um, t that the egg put out wasn't necessarily comparable to what you would see in an air quality monitoring network. So this really raised questions. How could regulators take seriously the data that citizens are collecting? What does this data look like, um, and how to make sense of it if you're actually trying to challenge the kinds of readings that official um, monitoring stations might be producing, and also how you might be able to produce new data sets that could provide different pictures about uh, what's going on in urban air pollution? So these are... Um, technologies we then took out into the field to actually test in more detail in relation to the official monitoring stations, to try out a range of technologies, to map those, and to create maps to look at pollution hotspots, and to see in more detail not just re what sort of readings you're getting from a fixed pollution station, but what sorts of pollution uh, readings you might be getting as you move through the city. And this is another important point, is that you might understand pollution differently if you look at your individual exposure as opposed to what a fixed station is telling you. 
So um, we've done, as I mentioned, a kind of first wave of this testing. Um, here's a, a citizen sensing kit that we developed for pollution sensing to look particularly um, at how citizens might monitor pollution in relation to industry, specifically hydraulic fracturing. And we created this kit and deployed it to over 30 citizens to use over a space of seven months. What we found was really interesting um, is in the process of generating data, um, it's a bit of an advancement problem, that uh, the data that citizens uh, generated which um, was quite interesting because they had a spatially dense network of collecting data, is that regulators didn't necessarily take seriously um, the data that citizens were gathering. So this was a conversation that citizens began to have with their policymakers. They began to notice patterns in relation to industry events, for instance, um, and then began to ask how uh, regulators might do something in relation to these events, and it was a conversation about how robust um, and accurate the citizen data was, which is quite um, an interesting conversation, I think, as sensors develop, and everyone's using them, including in wearables. So this is something we then took into thinking about how to rethinkify the smart city. If smart cities are spaces in which there is a kind of pro um, proliferation of sensors, and citizens are meant to also be sensing, then what role is there for citizens in thinking about how to rethinkify, rethink and rework the smart city so it's not just a top-down tech initiative, but it's actually something that citizens can contribute to in a variety of ways. So we had a workshop recently uh, in Berlin where we asked a number of people, if you could rethinkify the smart city and the kinds of urban sensing that went on there, what sorts of scenarios might you develop? And here you can see of everything from smart grids and people rethinking smart grids such that homes might become power plants in a decentralized uh, power network, um, to taking data walks, collecting data, air quality monitoring, of course, and generating new kinds of citizen engagement. But here, as I've mentioned, a kind of critical question is how can that data that citizens gather be taken seriously in regulatory spaces and beyond? So that's something that we're now beginning to test in a second wave of urban sensing, which is in South London, where we're looking at air quality, um, again, in an urban environment. So thanks very much uh, to the ERC, of course, and if you're interested to follow the project, we're at citizensense.net. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. And finally, I'd like to invite Professor Leiber. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. My name is Bastian Leibe, and I want to give you a quick overview over my ERC starting ground project, uh, CV Super Computer Vision for Scene Understanding from a First Person Perspective. So the overarching goal we're, we're trying to achieve here is to create the technological basis for performing dynamic scene understanding. More precisely, we're interested in the visual understanding of actions and interactions by people in busy public spaces. So we want to go out into the world and process video that is similar to what we humans see and get closer to the capabilities uh, that we humans use in our daily lives of analyzing and understanding this visual input. In particular, we are specifically interested in uh, interactions that affect future motion and to predict this kind of motion. And this is a very important capability in order to enable future applications uh, such as variable assistant devices, um, such as seeing aids for the blind, uh, future service robotics, or intelligent vehicles. Now, if you look at specifically service robots, uh, this current state of the art is that here you, you perceive the scene, you see people as obstacles. They might be in different places at different times, but it's still a major challenge to go out with a robot into such a crowded environment and move through the crowd in a, busy, uh, in, in a socially acceptable manner where the robot anticipates people's motions. Similarly, if you want an assistant device 
to enable a blind person to walk through a crowd as you can see it in such a place like here. This is still a major technological challenge and we are working towards creating the technology uh, to enable such applications. So here we want to take computer vision and go out with it in, into the open. Um, look at the at video input that is similar to what a human sees and interpret the scenes that we're seeing there. So this involves uh, detecting people in the environment, uh, tracking them over time, estimating the motion and predicting how this motion will continue. In a sense, this is very similar to some of the research that Luc van Gogh has shown. Here, our, in our case, the difference is that we're not interested in aggregated traffic flows, but instead of analyzing what such a scene means for our own navigation decisions. But this also doesn't stop with looking at people. Um, if you look at busy outdoor settings, you will also observe a large number of other unknown objects that you might never have seen before, but which still affect people's motions, such as here, a child stroller. Um, and we want to be able to detect such objects and analyze how people are interacting with them. Similarly, we are interested in how people are interacting amongst themselves, social behaviors that are expressed here, and all of those interactions and behaviors do not occur in isolation, they're always a factor of the environment. So we're also interested in analyzing the semantics of the environment. Now, let me highlight some of those uh, research challenges. Here in particular, for looking at unknown objects, we want to be able uh, to process such uh, video input, detect and track people, and then also to make sense of things that we may, may have never seen before, such as uh, a wheelchair here or, or this uh, uh, the, the, the suitcase, be able to recognize that there is an unknown object, analyze its 3D shape, compare it to things that we have similar, uh, we have seen before with similar motion patterns, and then interpret the scene. Also for known objects like people, we want to analyze whether their shape indicates that they might be carrying luggage that could also affect uh, their future motion. Once we have detected such objects, we are then interested in analyzing the interactions. So here, in such a case, uh, we want to be able to recognize that uh, this person is pulling uh, a suitcase there are different, uh, di different cases here. Th this guy is pulling f uh, with the left hand, and then it's switching to the right hand. I here, in this case, we have a person pushing a child stroller. Those green bars indicate group interactions, where people are walking together and where the motions are also uh, affected by uh, the other motion of people in the group. And finally, when looking at the environment, we're interested in getting a better understanding of the semantics of all the input that we see, really at a pixel level. So here, for each pixel of this video, we want to understand whether this pixel shows road, sidewalk, buildings, vegetation, and so on, because those are regions that, uh, that affect what kinds of objects we can expect to see there, and how people may interact with those objects in those locations. So in our research, we're working towards putting all of those components together in order to create the technology to perform uh, dynamic scene understanding and create better motion prediction uh, and enable such future mobile applications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, now I'd like to invite Professor Jean-Bierre Bourguignon from the ERC on stage and join us in a discussion with the researchers. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Professor Bourguignon, you've just seen three of the researchers presenting what they do and what's funded by the ERC. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on 
the type of work they're doing, how it impacts the citizens of Europe, and how their particular focus is part of the broader goal of what the ERC is aiming to fund in terms of science. Thank you for inviting me, and also thank you for Science Business of taking a lead of a group of partners to make the work of ERC better known in many different environments in uh, places where the public is coming. Um, so the, the whole point of ERC when it was created uh, already now almost nine years ago is, uh, was really a request of the scientific community to really have a very simple uh, process by which the European Commission would be supporting bottom-up research. That is, the initiative is fully in the hands of researchers. And uh, actually, in my capacity as president of ERC, really what is uh, fantastic is the capacity of meeting this uh, lady and gentleman with uh, their own initiative. So we are covering all areas of research, I mean, from uh, physics, engineering, life sciences, social sciences, humanities. And indeed, some people uh, have their, think their best ideas, their best projects are connected to topics you have chosen, namely urban cities. But uh, people are really proposing many different things of many different kinds. And for us, what is really important is their initiative, the fact that they feel this is the most important thing they want to deal with. And uh, giving them their f this freedom is really the, at the heart of ERC, and we're always fighting for this freedom. And uh, so you have chosen, I mean, with your partners, to uh, focus on some uh, topics, which is completely fine, because at some point you have to show that there is a critical mass. But in a sense, we never think of critical mass. We always think of what is the best uh, place for people to exert their, their uh, initiative and their, um, what they propose as their best ideas. And, uh, and uh, the responsibility of the Scientific Council, which is uh, in charge, actually, of uh, deciding how to spend the money, is really to make sure that the evaluation is only based on scientific quality of the project, which uh, requires mobilizing the best possible evaluators from all around the world, not only from Europe. Uh, but also making sure that, um, in particular, we have, put in, we have put a very specific focus on younger people, and in particular, two-thirds of the money actually is going to younger people. I'm sorry to say that for you, but uh, still we are financing a few more senior people. Uh, so this is really the, the whole spirit of the program. We have been uh, very well supported by the Commission in this endeavor, which uh, was new to the Commission for a good reason, because the the treaties didn't allow earlier the Commission to really finance a project of this nature because research was not a domain of uh, shared responsibility of the European Union. And it was really uh, the uh, Lisbon Treaty which allowed this. And the treaty was uh, effective 2009, but already 2007 we could start. Okay. So going back to the researchers again then, um, I wanted to ask, how is, this, how is what you're doing making a difference in the lives of citizens around Europe or around the world. Uh, perhaps we can start with Jennifer, since your research is very citizen-centric, and then maybe we can talk to Bastien and Luke a little bit about that. Um, how is it any different from what we see now with automated cars, Google Maps, uh, and other 3D modeling? Um, yeah, well, what we're doing is really putting to the test some of the claims that are made about the Internet of Things, um, about smart cities, and about how sensors will enable citizens to become more empowered. Um, what does that empowerment look like? Are people really better able to engage with policymakers um, to have more effective forms of uh, political engagement? If so, what does that look like? And if not, then why not? So one of the things we're finding quite interesting is that just because you're gathering air pollution data doesn't necessarily mean you are able to change the problem of air pollution. Um, so that's quite an interesting sociological finding in a way. By testing technologies with communities, we're then able to ask, how could we make a change with this data? If it's not just a data-driven or evidence-driven set of interactions, what else is required? And we're finding that politics don't go away just because you're using technology. They're just reconfigured. Um, so that's quite an interesting finding. And we're hoping that that's actually a contribution to be made, not just thinking about how sensors and technologies in the Internet of Things inform politics, not just how new forms of data inform politics, but also how politics could potentially be reinvented and reconfigured through these um, applications. Thank you. Yeah, in, in my case, um, I think there is a huge potential for technology to provide benefits to people in the, uh, in the form of assistant devices um, or future ro robotics applications. Um, where at the moment 
the, the roadblocks are simply that we, we have such complex scene understanding problems uh, that current technology cannot solve yet. So uh, here we, we are really trying to remove some of those roadblocks and create the, the basis on, on which such devices can be built. And for, for me, the, the prime example is always uh, the, the seeing aid for the blind. So um, to enable people to participate in everyday life activities that, that are currently not easily possible. Um, crowded spaces uh, that, that create uh, tough navigation problems. And if we can create help for them to, uh, to, to really navigate in such spaces, this would already be a huge benefit. Okay. Well, it's certainly not far from uh, practical applications, of course. Um, if I look at uh, what we are doing, for instance, uh, I'm also leading the uh, autonomous driving lab of Toyota in Europe, the biggest uh, European lab on autonomous driving. And of course, many of the things that we have to deal with uh, with this city modeling uh, problem are of direct relevance also for that application, to just name one. Um, for instance, uh, Bastian has also mentioned uh, trying to predict what people will do next. Well, that's a very big issue in autonomous driving. Uh, it's, it's crucial. You gain maybe those one or two critical seconds that make the difference between a, a catastrophe or nothing bad happening. Um, the, the same for uh, the way of uh, updating knowledge about 3D cities. Uh, there is a big problem with responsibility, of course, of autonomous cars. Uh, they can drive around as long as their model of the environment is correct. Mm -hmm. But that also presumes that you have m m means to uh, regularly update the model of the environment, otherwise you are just uh, making mistakes. Um, so all these things certainly tie in and quite directly now with uh, practical applications. And if you look at uh, the field of computer vision, and indeed I'm old enough to know a bit about the past there too, right? If you compare with the earlier days of computer vision, it was all rather uh, theoretical and uh, abstract maybe still, although in machine vision so industrial inspection there was an important application, but that went away a bit from academia because that became its own niche industry mm -hmm. uh, because it also requires a lot of specialized knowledge about one particular application of uh, one type of industry. Uh, but later on, uh, and we are now living those days, uh, it has become a consumer product. And so now we have computer vision on mobile devices, we have computer vision in cars, in just almost like anything you can imagine tomorrow. Uh, and that makes a big difference, of course. It's really now a, a very widely used technology that people are also increasingly acquainted with. Okay. Uh, in a moment, I'll open up uh, for some questions from the audience. But I just, going back to what you said and what we saw in some of your videos, uh, one of the inter interesting things I saw is that in order for you to acquire this data, um, I was wondering if there are any sort of privacy issues or privacy-related topics you have to deal with, because what I see in yours, for example, is quite a bit of mapping on streets as you go along with yours, quite a bit of recording in public spaces of people moving around. So how do... You mentioned roadblocks earlier. I don't know if this is one of the roadblocks you were discussing, um, having to deal with certain hurdles in going about your research. Um, I, I was more talking about technological ro okay. roadblocks, but um, it, it's clearly also a societal challenge. So uh, what kind of technologies do we want? Uh, how can we devise them in a way that they are privacy preserving, even privacy enhancing in, in cases? Um, so, so here, in terms of the research that we're doing, we're uh, at the cutting edge, so we're very aware of those challenges. Um, we're very responsible in what we do with the data that, uh, that we acquire, that we process. Um, if you look at the applications that we envision, so here the vision is really to create something that creates scene understanding capabilities on the device itself. So the device does not need to store video. It does not need to, uh, to transmit any visual data. It's just there in order to provide navigational aids um, 
provide uh, scene understanding capabilities uh, to the robotic, automotive, uh, or variable applications. Okay. Um, we have to go there. We have to get there. Um, so it's technology is not at that level yet, but this is the vision. And here, if you think about what what uh, we process, it's basically nothing else than what a human would see if he would walk through the same path. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, to emphasize that, actually, maybe that's a bit the European disease. Is this, uh, People are always afraid of technology. In the newspapers now, there was also a whole discussion about the massive job losses that would happen and so on. It's almost like opting out from the possibility to create these new technologies in Europe and be part of that. Right? So certainly, uh, in the past, technology has not uh, destroyed jobs. It has always created more jobs than it destroyed, and actually more interesting jobs also. Uh, so that as a remark before. Okay. But n now, if in as far as technology goes, I think technology can also be, be a great protector of uh, privacy. And in uh, our project, for instance, I see it that way. It's really like uh, privacy by design. Um, for instance, if you take something like Google Street View, there will be people visible there on the street. And of course, you can blur their faces, but that would not mean that people who know those persons would not recognize them somehow. You could probably identify quite a few people if you, are, uh, you know that part of town. Um, but suppose now you can recognize, indeed, these are people, that's, that's a car and so on, you can take them out of the model. And instead, when I talk about traffic flows, of course we do not want to show the individual people leaving their door in the morning at 8.35 precisely, and uh, show that in any model. We want to show the typical flows that exist, how dense those flows are, and visualize them nicely, so that it's also a neat thing to look at. But it's all anonymized, and it's anonymized because of the technology. It's the very technology that, in fact, guarantees the, uh, the privacy. Okay. Uh, is there one or two questions we have in the audience that we can take quickly? Yes, I, I can't resist asking these questions to, uh, to particularly to you, Luc, but also to the others and, and to Jean-Pierre. And that's, of course, when you listen to the examples you gave and particularly the companies which you already created out of the project, is what your views are on the European Innovation Council. What, is exactly what your views are what, on the what, what EIC are. as yes. being all researchers or, uh, in charge of the ERC and to what extent what happens in the ERC with these examples you show to some extent that there is a lot of innovation potential coming out of your ERC project. I think the ERC is fantastic and it uh, has filled uh, a hole somewhere so to, to have you said it's not about critical mass, but not for these individual apps. It will be about critical mass to, do, to let certain things happen, to create certain visions, and to have the breadth and the depth of the research going on. Um, more than any individual smaller project would be able to do. And I cannot I appreciate that enough, because this is, makes a big difference to people. Um, in terms of creating the companies, so my experience is a big problem in Europe Launch with the capital, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I've, I've seen that happen before. Uh, for instance, on that list was uh, the company Kuaba. Right? Um, when we created Kuaba, we were the first to actually allow for the recognition of objects with a mobile phone by taking a photograph and recognize it. But a couple of months later, there was another company created in the United States called Snaptel. And there was a big difference, not in the technology. I think we were quite ahead with the technology. But the difference li uh, was in the fact that we got 200,000 um, yeah, Swiss francs, it was, uh, seed capital. And these guys got $2 million. Okay? And so all of a sudden, you're not on a level playing field anymore. But this creates quite a difference in how far you can go with making yourself known and so on. So uh, after that, uh, like maybe one year after that, uh, Snapchat was bought, bought by Amazon, and uh, so they had a successful exit. We were, in the meantime, also acquired by Qualcomm, and maybe that's the second point. In fact, all the acquisitions we had so far, th these were acquisitions by American companies, which is also interesting to note. Professor Bergenio? 
Yes, I think uh, Luc Sutter is raising a very important issue because the, definitely the purpose of uh, ERC is to really make sure that in Europe we have absolutely leading researchers and uh, really the, and give them, empower them to really develop their most uh, brilliant ideas. And actually for the Scientific Council it was clear that uh, it was um, actually necessary to also develop actually a smaller program which is inside the ERC which is called Proof of Concept which actually helps the researchers to uh, make the first steps towards uh, commercialization or actually responding to social needs. Actually, we have both. And uh, the good news is in the sense that uh, minimal researchers than we expected at the beginning actually uh, showed interest and actually we do have uh, um, something like uh, 120 such projects supported every year. So it's a small amount of money which is provided on top of the ERC grant which allows the researchers actually to develop uh, uh, really these first contacts with, towards, uh, say, industry or social needs. We know that uh, there is a so-called death valley which comes next, and you, you pointed to that, which is uh, in the US uh, business angels are, in a sense, uh, able or taking more risk. And taking risk is not something which is really very much uh, embedded into the uh, European culture. And I think this is something which needs to be addressed. Um, of course, it's not our responsibility, but we are very serious about that, up to the point that, for example, very soon uh, I will have, with the people from the European Business Angel Network, uh, an appointment in Luxembourg with the European Investment Bank to discuss exactly this issue that uh, definitely the, in the context of the European Fund for Strategic Investment, FC, more projects which are research-based should be really considered and uh, really uh, financed. Of course, it's not our business to do that, but we want to, to prove, uh, I mean, that we have first interest in that, that we can provide credibility because some of the projects supported by ERC are really among uh, the absolutely most uh, best, best possible quality and uh, as you've seen they address all kind of issues many of them are actually completely interdisciplinary and they are completely relevant for a number of things uh, of course it's not we cannot fund them that's not our duty but we feel that we also create uh, some kind of a pool of uh, very interesting uh, projects which need to be nurtured and we want to accompany this movement Maybe, yes, maybe. maybe a closing remark then. Yeah, okay. well, the two uh, companies I mentioned as the outcome of the RC indeed also got the POC uh, support. Okay. Thank you. So I think we'll end there. You have to get back to a meeting, and I think everyone's waiting to get to lunch outside. Uh, Rich, do you have an announcement? Yeah, yeah I was, well, thank you very much to the panel first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the. the this is what we've just seen here is frontier research, blue sky. But frontier research can affect your life. And that's kind of the point that we're trying to get across. That when we look through the ERC database, there were about 80 projects over the years that have been done on different aspects of urban problems and urban life. That affects about, 70, about nearly 70% of the European population. And as we go, that's therefore it's important. It works out to about 125 million euros that the ERC has, has granted since 2007 on different aspects of urban problems. That's without anybody from on top saying it should be. That's a reflection of the strength of the scientific community in Europe. And that's, that is ultimately the message that we're trying to get across here. In the next three years, we will be picking out other strands of ERC research, like food. Why does it taste the way it does? What's that about? Psychology, chemistry, biology, uh, history, uh, linguistics, culture, you know, what, why is food? the way it is, uh, music, uh, sensory perception, robotics, all these different themes that affect all of our lives. So we ask you to go to sciencesquared.eu and sign up for the newsletter. You'll find out more. Thank you very much. <laughs>